this morning. Um, similar to previous uh, Zoom meetings, this is um, the OPI, some of our state education partners, and then we've invited district and county superintendents, um, as well as um, board chairs. So thanks for joining us this morning. Um, we've got Mark Beckman primarily talking about um, sports guidance and the latest updates he has on that. But at the end, we will also have our finance experts, Paul Taylor and Ken Bailey, talk a little bit about the announcement that came from the governor's office yesterday on transportation, um, as well as Ken has some updates on the ESSER funds. So we'll save those for the end. But first, I want to turn it over to Superintendent Arn. Uh, Superintendent Arnson. Good morning, all. Um, school is opening and it's coming to you and your doors. I know you're going to be very uh, concerned about the safety, working with your county health, as much as social distancing and using everything that is available for our students to be safe. And it's also about learning. So I uh, also wanted to offer this because it's about student engagement and having Mr. Beckman uh, and being a partner in this discussion as school doors open is exceedingly important. So with that, Dylan, let's continue. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, so Mark, I think at this time, we'll turn it over to you for some MHSA updates. Um, and if there's anything you wanna share on the screen, you should be able to. Okay. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks, Superintendent Arnston and Dylan for the opportunity for the MHSA to uh, share with you some of our information regarding our return to fall activities plans. I know all of you had received this on July 27th, so I won't go into detail on it, but I will uh, touch on a few things and then of course leave it open for some questions. I know on the call today or on the Zoom today, Denny Bennett, our board president is with us as is Doug Reisig, our vice president, and I'm sure there's other board members. So if you have questions specific to the board, I know they'll be able to answer those too. But to start it all off, there's no doubt that right now as we're moving close to the start of practices for golf on Thursday and other fall activities on Friday, the question is to play or not to play. So with that said, as we are moving forward right now, our board is looking at and has looked at that we believe the resumption of sports and other activities is crucial to the growth, the development, and the mental and emotional wellness of our youth. And as we created these plans, they were months and months in, in, in process for sure. We looked at uh, guidance from the CDC, a lot from our uh, National Federation, our National Organization Sports Medicine Advisory Committee, the governor's directives, of course, to stay within those, and then state health department, and of course, state associations across the country, especially our state high school associations that are in our region and that are, uh, are right uh, bordering us and what are they doing and how are they doing it and how can we uh, return to these activities with safety, the safety of our participants in mind and not only our participants but our coaches, officials and fans. Uh, with that said, we have at this time looking at starting in what we call tier one where contests can be played on the scheduled dates if the required practice is starting uh, this week are held. Uh, we have done some things that I think are unique to any state association. We have limited all multi-team events in football, volleyball, and soccer to minimize the risk of transmission of, of the virus. Um, volleyball tournaments are the main staple, you know, of the volleyball, and of course, they no longer will happen in regard to regular season. We're going to go to duels and make sure that we can get teams in and teams out. For golf, which you can be more social distance, we've changed that quite a bit in regard to having teams have to enter to their hole, um, and that's the only place in goal. They have to play with their own teammates, which never was the case before. They used to play the number ones against the number ones, so on and so forth, and then they have to leave right after. So we're trying to do some things that are uh, creative to uh, work through these things and, and the same thing with cross country. So as we go through that, we also know that later this week, our executive board is looking at meeting. We have a request from the AA ADs to, that they would like to cancel their non-conference games and just move into conference games, wait a little while, delay, get some more practices in. 
that'll come up in front of the board. Uh, I don't think the board will have any problem with that. I can't speak for the board, but Denny or, or Doug is on the call and they can say something to that. But if there is a, an approval, we would, I would recommend that the approval be for all classifications because I've heard some other classifications would like to maybe do the same. So we would treat everybody the same in regard to that. There has been some talk uh, through, I know there's three superintendents in AA that would like to see a switch of seasons in regard to, I think, more so of a four season type of thing. We're getting pretty late into the year or into the start of this particular school year to, for that, but it will come up in front of the board. The board will review that and then I'll get those actions to you. Uh, maybe with that said, the last thing I'll say before I open up to questions is today I sent to all the administrators a frequently asked question document. Those are the questions we're getting, of course, supposed to ask in our office. We have sent those out to everybody. We have posted those on our coronavirus page, information page. So hopefully those will be helpful to you. And we have all our other resources on mhsa.org. And I know, uh, thank, I thank OPI, I thank the state. They have been sharing our resources also. So you can get them in a variety of places. Maybe I'll turn it quickly over to Denny uh, for any comments and any things that he'd like to uh, share too. Thanks, Mark. Uh, honestly, uh, I think you covered most everything that uh, I was thinking. So I, I just like to appreciate and say thanks to the board and the office of MHSA for the work they've done in trying to get things going. Uh, Mark and I talk almost daily right now, and it seems like we get two steps ahead and then one step back with everything. So uh, it's a lot, been hard, a lot of hard work uh, for Mark and his staff. They've done a great job. Thank you, Denny and Mark. Really appreciate those updates. Doug, is there anything that you want to add before we go over to questions or comments? Uh, Dylan, thank you. And I, I'll just echo what Denny and Mark have said. And I, I want people to understand that this is a very difficult decision. Uh, we're concerned about the health, welfare, and safety of our student athletes and, and, and kids that participate in activities. Uh, we're also concerned about the fact that uh, the emotional health of our kids and getting them back into uh, as normal a routine as we possibly can. I mean, the, 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 the COVID-19 situation is obviously impacting a lot of us in a lot of different ways and, and kids are taking a disproportionate hit on it. And, uh, and so we're just trying to find that balance. And, and I know that this uh, meeting coming up is gonna be a very significant meeting and, and a very important one in terms of where we go as an association and what we do for our kids. So thanks, Dylan. Yes, thank you all. Um, sports guidance is one of the largest areas of requests that we're getting at the OPI, so we appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, at this time, we'll jump into questions and comments, I suppose. Um, so uh, Mike Perry has a question about when that decision is gonna be made on the AA's request. Yeah, Mike, we're gonna we're looking at uh, Denny and I spoke this morning. We finally got an official request. Or not finally, we got the official request yesterday, late yesterday afternoon. So I'm gonna reach out to our executive board. We're looking at maybe Thursday morning, but we'll have to see if we have a quorum available of our executive board. So sometime toward the end of this week. Okay, and that question we got from Scott Kinney, um, we've actually had several um, people suggest this. Uh, has M MHSA considered flipping uh, fall and spring sports? Yes, if you look at our tiers, we have five tiers. But when the board, uh, when I initially uh, presented this to the board, there were seven tiers. And the sixth tier was the flipping of, of fall seasons. And the board discussed it at length, uh, Swift. Uh, switching or flipping fall to spring. One of the concerns we had is then do you flip that and put it on top of spring where the spring athletes didn't have a chance to participate at all last year. So then all of a sudden we would be having kids having to make decisions on whether they're going to play football, volleyball, run cross country, or play a spring sport they didn't have the opportunity to play last year. That, that didn't, uh, we didn't think that would be probably fair. The idea of four seasons, having someone uh, being able to um, try to fit all that in, 
especially with what we're getting from our national leaders, our national doctors are saying that our winter sports are going to be more challenged than we ever would think. And one of the reasons why they're saying that is at that time, there's going to be cold and flu. When cold and flu comes, we're going to have kids coughing. We're going to have those kind of things. You don't know whether it's COVID or not, and you may not be even have the ability to test. So that could bump right into that where we wouldn't have anything. So we looked at it to say, we're going to we start now. This could be where we would have the best opportunity to be able to begin and not push it off put it on top of or try to uh, shorten seasons so that we may not have anything at all. Thanks for that. Um, if there's any other questions or comments, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, post them in the chat. Um, Mark, could you address the volleyball not having tournaments? Sure. When we have a volleyball tournament, an invitational tournament, you can bring a lot of times there's 12, 14, 16 teams coming in. So they're all coming in. They come through the same entrance. They come through and they, they melt together. They play on multiple floors. And so there's a lot of opportunity for transmission. The medical experts are saying that if you are, the longer that you're exposed to that, to the more people you're exposed to, they're even saying sometimes over 30 minutes of exposure, that becomes pretty risque. So with that, we said, let's go and make sure that we are not going to be sideways with our health departments and that, and say these multi-team events that are coming in that now you'll see in some areas are getting we're getting canceled toward the end of the summer, some of the baseball tournaments and, and all that, at least multi-tournament or multi-team. The individual games were not getting canceled. So that's why we wanted to be ahead of the game in regard to that. Hey, Mark, this is Lori Duss at Park High School. How are you? Good, how are you, Lori? Good, good. Hey, um, and I know we've had some conversation on this, but um, and you're aware that our Park County Health Department um, has some great concerns about us traveling out of county and going to um, areas with uh, high incidence of community spread. So, like, what are you guys, how are you guys handling it? Or can you guarantee that, you know, what things are being put in place to protect our adults and our kids? Um, if we choose not to forfeit. And I'll unmute myself sure. or mute myself. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, we've had some long talks about this and, and I know you're, you're dealing with that and it's, it's a difficult situation. But what our board has said, like uh, other states are doing, Iowa actually plays their high school uh, softball and baseball during the summer. They just completed it and it was very successful. But what they did, and we, I had proposed this to the board and they adopted that, if because of your health department or because of you know maybe a quarantine or something in place like that because of the COVID, that those contests will be considered no contest. And then, as I said in all the summer meetings for classifications, you want to work on how are you going to seed then if we have you know a team that's out for two weeks and or can't travel to this particular location. Uh, if they if they are playing and it's and they're saying the local health department saying it's safe to play then we look at that and they don't want to go so that people aren't picking and choosing or we want to don't really want to play them because they're good some kind of thing like that and try to figure that out then we would say it's a forfeit so there is the uh, you know our board can look at that on any of those kind of issues to say well that's beyond the control of the school because of the particular health department and the other part of the question is what can we guarantee um, in regard to what we're doing, if it'll work, we can't guarantee anything, of course, but we definitely believe that these are some of the best practices that can be done to make sure that we minimize those risks. And then for each individual, whether you're coaching, whether you're playing, whether you're going to be a fan or official, if you have some concerns, then of course, we understand with respect that you may not want to do any of those particular things. So, Mark, this is Lori again. Um, I'll try not to monopolize the conversation, but, um, you know, one of the things that we're hitting heavy here in Park County 
because we we're, were we work pretty hard at keeping the cases low because of our tourist season and all. And um, how uh, like how will we contact trace? Because that seems to be one of the main things that really has helped keep our numbers down here in Park County. Um, what, what do we have in place to do that? We, what we have looked at in regard to that is guidance. We've you know, asked the governor's office for some clarifications and some things. Uh, a lot of has been put back to the local health departments. So that's where we go with contact tracing. For example, as I traveled this summer watching Legion baseball, there's some areas that we'd go in and we'd have to put our name and our uh, cell phone number before we could go into the event. In other areas, that wasn't the case. So we have to uh, rely on those particular local health departments on what those policies are as you travel to or travel into a location. Thanks, Mark and Lori. Um, so there's a couple questions. One is about restrictions for overnight double headers for soccer, and that might um, you might be able to expand that to overnighters in general. Um, and then thoughts on spectators. Sure. In, in regard to overnighters, that's up to the local conference or division because they they will make those particular schedules up. Some of them may be traveling from you know you to Kalispell to play both teams and they're okay. They're just playing a duel on, on Friday and then staying overnight and playing a duel on Saturday against a different team. That would be up to them as long as they meet our requirements and restrictions that are listed or considerations, you know, and then um, in regard to, uh, what was the other question, Dylan? Uh, with regards to spectators, um, do you have any oh, recommendations yeah, on that? Yeah, we're going to leave that. We have to leave that up to the local health departments because they have that authority and autonomy to do that. And again, as I traveled the state in baseball, we, you were able to go into some and have, um, you know, 200 as long as they were social distanced and spread out and seats were marked off. And others, you could go in and they said, no, we're only going to allow 50. Um, but in every location that I went throughout the state, fans were allowed. It was just a, a different number. Yep. And so with sports, um, it's similar to general uh, reopening school plans. Obviously, um, we have to follow the governor's directives and state state law um, and MHSA is the governing body for sports. Um, but anything that's not addressed in those areas, uh, we certainly encourage you to work with your county health departments on all aspects of your school reopening plan. Um, they'll be a, a really good asset. Um, so there's a question about sanctions or penalties um, for not following uh, MHSA's COVID guidance, I guess. Can you uh, outline those, Mark? Sure. The penalties will come in and it'll depend on the, what, the, what the actual violation is. And then the executive director have the penalty put in place. Uh, I would say this, that we are looking at it from the, uh, from the board standpoint too, that those penalties could be serious. And the reason why is if schools aren't going to follow it, then that could actually risk all of our schools and teams to be, to be able to play. That's a real concern to us. We don't want to have, you know, a school, a team or whatever saying, well, we're just not going to do it. And then all of a sudden we have a state health directive coming down. Well, if they're not doing it, we're, we're going to shut everything down. So there could be serious consequences for those, uh, those violations. Okay. And then there's a couple of questions about masks. Um, oops. There's a couple questions about masks. And so I know the OPI has put some requests into the, to the governor's office and um, I know MHSA has put in some requests on a variety of topics and I don't know if you have any updates, uh, Mark, on those. But with regards to masks, does MHSA have guidance um, in, say, for instance, there's a county that is requiring a team to wear masks, going to play a county that does not require masks? Um, how is the MHSA going to handle that? I suppose it would be kind of a, a discrepancy between one the way one team is treated during the tournament versus how another team is treated. Yeah, that's a great question, Dylan. And as you know, I did submit that question to the uh, governor's office. 
and they did come back and say that would be a local health department uh, issue. So with that said, in our meeting this week, I'm going to propose to the executive board that all MHSA teams, whether they have four cases or less, will be wearing masks so, masks so that we can reduce the opportunity or the risk of transmission into a particular area or out of a particular area. But that'll be up to the board to determine whether then it'll be just a standard MHSA mask policy for all. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll look forward for those updates. Um, are there any other comments or questions at this time? And I didn't, I didn't see McCall on the line, but she may have jumped in or might be one of the phone numbers. But of course, McCall, feel free to jump in anytime if you'd like to, or any of the other education partners that we have on the line today, feel free to jump in. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah. I I do know that um, some of the questions that Mark has sent, we've forwarded over to the state epidemiologist to get more information on. Um, so hopefully we'll have those back soon. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Um, there's a question about postseason volleyball. Um, how is postseason volleyball going to work? That's another good question for all of our postseason. We are ready with plans in case of where, or depending on where we're at, if there's a, if we have to be more restrictive, then we're going to look at alternate postseason formats, and those are all ready and prepared. For example, in district and divisional volleyball, we may be playing playoffs, just like the AA used to do for all of their sports, where one would play eight at one site, two would play seven at two sites, and then the next day you go through. It's easy in districts because it's usually they're close. Divisionals it may be a little more prob problematic. Uh, Bob Hogemark from Park City called yesterday with a great plan to say we'll have two different gyms. We'll have the top bracket play here. One team, uh, two teams come in and then they leave. Then they clean. Two team or two more teams come in and then they leave. So that's an alternate one that we hadn't even thought of. So we appreciate those uh, those suggestions. So there are plans out there in case we have to. If we get all the way to the state, for example, cross country or state volleyball, and we're still in a situation where we're at 50s or at the 50s phase two, then we will look at even splitting those tournaments out instead of having all class. We'll put them in maybe locales. And if we have to even go to playoff structure for state tournaments. Thank you. And there's a couple of questions about that FAQ document. Um, we can send that out after this, this meeting. Um, Mark, if you could send that to us, and if you already did, I apologize. Um, we'll go ahead and send it out with the recording of this meeting today. Thank you. Um, a question from Superintendent Kinney. Um, I'm just going to read this. So to be clear, the decision not to move football and volleyball to spring and golf, tennis, and track to fall was based on students having to make a difficult choice instead of the ability to manage social distancing this fall. Our board is requesting clarification. Right, and I'll, and if Scott, if you send me an email, I'll send you back something so you can have uh, clarification to your board. And then also our board this week will be looking at that, the three AA superintendents that signed the letter about looking at a season switch and then we can get more uh, clarity there from our own from our board too in regard to their position on that particular issue Okay, thanks any other questions or comments Sound uh, mark it sounds like there's at least a few superintendents who have that same question So you might want to just blast that out to your whole membership that sounds good. Thank you, Dylan. Yep. A question from Lauren Dunk. The 10 hours brick and mortar requirement is waived. However, if a high school student's family decides it isn't safe to be in school and wants remote learning, wouldn't it be logical to say that it's also not safe to play the sport? So can't schools make that decision to say one must be doing in-person learning to play sports? That is what our local stance is. Um, and I will add that we've received that question a few times as well. Right, and that we would say it's, it's local control through your school board, but we also 
would uh, suggest that you check with your legal counsel in regard to that, um, whether that would be a, you know, a policy you should put in place or not, but you should check with your legal counsel. Thank you. Is there anyone else, um, any OPI staff or any of the education partners on the phone that want to jump in on any advice on that topic? I think generally, yeah, it's going to be a, a local control thing in consultation with your legal counsel. Um, any other questions or comments at this time? Hey, Dylan, Mark, Lori Dust again at Park High. Um, uh, what about safely busing more than 28 students per bus and in regards to social distancing? I know that was a question that we jointly submitted in regard to, I know OPI was looking at bus routes and we were looking at activity routes and, uh, and McCall can clarify, but that's gonna be a local school issue because it's education related, or not a local school, I'm sorry, a local health department issue is from what I understand. Mark, I think you're correct. We um, just suggest that you work with your local school district or your local public health to determine how many kids and if it's safe to do so and um, you know what that masking looks like. Yeah, and OPI would agree. Anything that involves health decisions, um, you know, we know that you guys are in the education industry, not the not the healthcare or medical industry. So work with your county health departments as much as possible. Um, we're coming up on 11 o'clock and I want to give Paul and Ken plenty of time. Are there any uh, final questions or comments for Mark? Thanks, Dylan. All right, we know that this is going to be an, an ongoing topic and we're probably, um, I know MHSA will probably be continuing to make updates and suggestions as we see how the fall sports season proceeds um, and what the he <clears throat> general health landscape of the state is in the next few weeks and months. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Paul Taylor now and I also saw that Nancy Hall is on the line, so thanks for joining Nancy. Um, and Paul has some updates on um, transportation. Thanks, Dylan. Um, I just wanted to uh, just one minute um, to say that an official email went out yesterday in regards to 10 million of the $75 million that the governor is providing to school districts. Um, for and this $10 million is specific to districts transportation um, costs associated with the fall COVID um, increases that may be necessary for uh, increase of routes or uh, individual contracts. Um, so the thing that I wanted to uh, bring to you is that tomorrow at 10 o'clock, there's an hour and a half webinar um, scheduled if you go into the official email section of the website, you can find the uh, information regarding that. Um, you don't have to register or anything. It's, it's there for you to uh, listen in. We're gonna go over about a half an hour of the presentation that was pre-recorded. We'll probably go through it again because I don't wanna assume that everybody watched it already. And then after that presentation, we'll have a Q&A period about how the mechanism works to receive funds related to the $10 million. Nancy, did you have anything you wanted to add? I don't. That sounds good. That's all I have. So if you have questions, have at it. <laughs> all right, thank you both. Are there any questions on that for uh, Paul Taylor with OPI or Nancy Hall with the budget office? All right, we'll just yeah continue to keep an eye out uh, and make sure that your clerks are keeping an eye out for um, email updates from OPI's finance division. Um, Ken, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the ESSER funds? Yeah, the ESSER grants, um, you know, the deadline for getting those in was the end of July. We've held it open because there's a handful of schools that are still completing their applications. 
Uh, we've also, you know, got, we're into a cycle now that um, schools can submit cash draws against, um, against what's been awarded in that grant. And once a month, probably by the 10th of the following month, um, we'll pay out those cash uh, requests. We, this past Friday, for example, we sent out about $500,000 of the ESTA grants to schools. I have seen some cases where because of the $65 million worth of the coronavirus funds provided by the governor to schools that have a, an expiration date of December 30th, that schools who uh, had plans for using the ESSER funds are changing their mind and saying, well, first we want to use the governor's funds because we have to spend those first. And that that may change how the funds are spent. And there's absolutely no problem with that. It's fairly easy to amend uh, the budget for the ESSER grant. And that does go out all the way to September of 2022. So we will obviously work with schools to, to give them the most flexibility in how they use these funds. Um, so again, to the extent that people are changing their mind on how to spend the funds that we've afforded, absolutely no problem with that. So uh, let me pause there and just see, it, it, again, not much of a topic here because we're in that cycle now where the awards have been, applications have been made, and now we're just waiting for cash requests. But are there any questions about the ESSER grant? Uh, that's really all I have. All right, thanks, Ken and Paul. Appreciate those updates. I thought you were probably gonna go a little bit longer. So <laughs> um, we do wanna respect everyone's time though. Are there any updates um, from any of the other education partners on the line or any other uh, questions or comments on topics that we did not discuss today? Hey Dylan, this is McCall. I just wanna give a quick update on CRF for Schools funding. Um, last, I guess, uh, July 31st was our first deadline. Um, sent out funding to 304 districts at about 54 million, almost $55 million. Um, we received 52 more applications since the Friday, July 31st deadline. Um, just a reminder that this Friday, August 14th, is our final deadline um, with funding going out on the 21st. So if school districts have not applied yet or have questions on how to apply, um, please shoot me an email, give me a call. I'm happy to walk you through the process. It's super easy um, and just want to make sure everyone has uh, everything they need to make sure they can apply. Are there any questions for McCall from the governor's office? All right, any questions or comments on any other topics that are on your mind? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, this is Dr. Desnick, Health Officer in Park County. Hi. Hi. So, you know, good conversation, lots of people. Thanks for being available. Our concerns uh, remain. Um, we now know that young people, middle and high school included, certainly can spread coronavirus and also can very much get infected themselves. We know that we have a number of counties in Montana that actually are experiencing community spread right now and that traveling for sports between counties, whether from a low uh, positivity area to a high or a high to a low, affects not only the kids, the coaches, the parents, the drivers, but also potentially affects the community at large in all of the places. and. Um, there's also the concern for added expense for transportation. There's time spent on the bus. There's time away from school. There's um, the lodging issues. And it feels like we need to really be looking at much bigger picture than really scheduling and um, on-site mitigation efforts. And I guess I'd like to hear from other counties because we're feeling quite pressured it seems like from a health perspective, we know the answer, but from a sports perspective, we continue to hear very different things. Thank you. Thank, 
Thank you for that comment. Um, I don't know if there are any other health officers or health departments on the line, but if there are, feel free to jump in. Um, or if there's anything that MHSA wants to add on that. We appre appreciate that feedback and certainly the OPI and um, MHSA um, appreciate that feedback. So they'll be taking that into consideration as they, the board makes plans. Um, are there, like I said, last call for any other county health officers that might be on the line? All right, any other final comments or questions? Yeah, so again, this is Lori Dust, and sorry to press this issue, you guys, but is there a response to Dr. Desnick's, um, to her, uh, what she just said? Uh, do you guys have a response to that for us? Hi, Lori. I, I think she shared her thoughts in regard to how she feels about what's the, um, what are the issues and what are those concerns. Those will come in front of our board now. I know with, I know two, at least two board members on there, they have, uh, Heard those uh, concerns. We'll address those as we as we move forward. Uh, one of the things too is as county health departments have allowed other events throughout the state, including I know I've been I was in Livingston for baseball uh, games there for Legion, and uh, I know there's certain um, requirements and all that. But also, if it's to the point too, I think we would we would like to know from our county health because as Dylan said, we're not the experts. Our, our local health department said if it's unsafe to play, then that would be something that we would want to hear from those health departments. But as we had progressed through, they were allowing, you know, there's been uh, events allowed uh, from graduations back in May all the way through to baseball and those kind of things. So we will take those uh, uh, comments and thoughts there and then share them with our executive board. Yeah, and of course we have 56, you know, county health officers across the state um, who get a lot of their information from DPHHS and the CDC. Um, so Mark, is MHSA in touch with DPHHS? I always mess up that mute button. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are. And we have talked, you know, especially as we went through our basketball tournaments. We were on the phone, actually Denny and Doug were both involved in a conference call with Sheila Hogan, the director and, and Jim Murphy and, and those people. So we've been in contact with them and, and a lot of times they, we, they refer to their local health, county health too. Yeah, but OPI is in contact, our health and safety division is in contact with, uh, with Jim Murphy and Dr. Holzman, um, the, the state leads on this issue. Um, so ultimately, um, if county health departments are, are looking for statewide guidance on some of these issues, um, the authority that you're going to want to work with, if there's going to be any statewide recommendations, is, is really going to be DPHHS. Um, they're the top medical officers for the state. Um, so I would encourage you to go that route. Any other questions or comments? I guess one last one in the chat box for you, Mark. Um, is it safe to say that wrestling, quad and triangular, triangular meets will probably be canceled this winter? Uh, we, we haven't received the guidance from our NFHS sports Medicine Advisory Committee. That's the one where they put together a lot of work through the national experts, our national medical experts. We haven't received that, but at this point right now, absolutely, that would not be uh, something that we would be able to do at this point, uh, at least where we're at in the phase we're at in Montana and what our uh, focus has been in trying to um, not uh, or minimize the risk of transmission. Okay. Well, last call for any final comments or questions. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, next Tuesday, we have uh, the University of Montana's, Montana's Bureau of Business and Economic Research 
um, talking a little bit about the uh, financial landscape of the state as it might apply to um, school funding. So I'll be sending out the Zoom information for that uh, meeting next Tuesday at 1030 with UM. Um, thanks for everything that you're doing and for joining these calls. It is being recorded so that we can share it out. Um, and we know that over these next few weeks, um, as schools really start ramping up and getting their plans out and at least getting some students back in the class, we're going to have to be responsive to what that looks like. Um, and at the state level here, we'll be offering as much um, as we can and working with our partners to do that. So thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Okay, we missed the part where he said that we get an extra $10 million. Thanks, Steve. <laughs>